Dr. Phyllis Massing and a member of the Board of Directors of the California Social Work Archives, also known as CSWA. It is Tuesday, September 25th, and it is my privilege and my pleasure to be speaking with Dr. Wendy Smith, Director of Instructional Enhancement at the University of Southern California School of Social Work and 2006 recipient of the George D. Nickel Award for Outstanding Professional Service in Social Welfare, which is given a by CSWA. So, Wendy, let's get started. Okay. Uh, how and when did you get involved in social work? Um, well, I went to graduate school, I want to say in aught six, but it was actually <laughs> 1968, uh, or it was 1970, actually. When I was in uh, college, I wasn't sure what I was going to do after I graduated. I thought, I might be a writer or a teacher, and so I tutored in the West Oakland ghetto. I was going to Cal Berkeley, and I realized when I went to the class each week that really what I wanted to do was talk to the kids about what was going on in their lives and not necessarily to be teaching them reading and writing. So I had a good friend who was doing her master's in social work at Berkeley, and she kind of told me about what the program was like and the kinds of things you could do. And so that led me to um, start that program at UCLA. Um, but I'm not sure if you're also asking why I think I ended up doing that, as well, opposed to just the decision to go to graduate school, yes, I mean, the deeper asking, part of it. Yes. Um, I think that probably it had a lot to do for me, as I think it does with most of us who go into social work with our early life experiences. Where, for example, in my experience, my parents were both um, Jewish refugees from Nazi Germany, um, emigrated to England and then to the States when I was very young. And they both were very troubled, both psychologically and also uh, as a result of their experiences um, during the Holocaust. So I think that had a lot to do with sensitizing me to people who experience pain and suffering and also with being kind of trained from an early age to be a caretaker of my parents in some respects. And um, for instance, throughout childhood, most of my friends were very troubled people who, and I was usually the person who listened and was supportive, and I think that's kind of the path to social work in many ways. But somehow you did not recognize that until you were at the graduate school. That's or right. Ready for graduate. That's school. right. I mean, it wasn't. I think as a child, I thought about being an actress, for example, or a writer, or a nurse. So um, that's right. I didn't. That didn't really come together for at me. At what, what time? At, at uh, what stage in your life did you realize that so much of your early life had? somehow led you on that, on the road to becoming a social worker? I think I probably realized that as I was doing it in the sense that I had already had psychotherapy um, as an adolescent and so I had already begun that kind of examination of my, you know, inner workings. So I think I, I kind of had some awareness of that. It's kind of a never-ending story. Yeah. You uh, got your MSW in 1970 at UCLA, but you had graduated in 68 from Berkeley with, right. I might mention, a Phi Beta Kappa in English literature. What, uh, how did you decide on UCLA rather than staying at Berkeley? Um, you know what? I can't recall exactly what, what I was thinking about at that point. I, I think, I, I'm not sure I even applied to Berkeley. I think I had just decided, because I'd grown up in Los Angeles, that I was going to come home and do it here. So 1970 is when you graduated with an MSW. Mm -hmm. What was the world like at that time, socially, politically, uh, economically? Well, as I'm sure you recall, it was a very turbulent time. There were a lot of very disturbing things going on politically, like the war in Vietnam. Um, and at the same time, there was, I would say, a greater sense of hope 
for people our age at that time to have an effect on what was going on in the world. You really felt that you could do things that made a difference and you could profoundly affect social events. And I'm not sure how much people feel that today, but I think, so I think it was complicated in that there were things that were going on that were very disturbing and at the same time I think one could feel that one's own views and behaviors could make a big difference. And in fact when I was in graduate school at UCLA, um, my second, the first year I was placed at DPSS, then DPSS, um, doing, you know, child welfare work. And as a result in part of that experience, the second year I was part of a special uh, community organization project or um, concentration within what was then community organization, what's now COPA, um, which was called grassroots organizing. And there was a very brilliant man who has since died who kind of spearheaded that and was the teacher of that group of people. There were seven of us and we went into neighborhoods and uh, created organizations, you know, identified issues that the people in the neighborhood were concerned about, helped them to create a neighborhood organization and did some kind of community action. And so, for example, I was in Lawndale, which was a kind of working class or poorer white neighborhood um, where railroad crossings were not protected in the poor section, but were in the upper income sections. So that was kind of the issue that our organization coalesced around. And we were investigated by the sheriff's department, you know, it was like that. And it, so it was very um, empowering to the people. And, and I shared in that experience. At the same time, I really didn't like my job in it, which was to constantly be kind of stirring up things and um, you know, knocking on doors, having meetings, that kind of thing. I really felt like it wasn't for me, even though theoretically I felt it was the right thing to be doing. So I didn't stay with that kind of work at that time. When you decided to change and move to in another direction, mm -hmm. what direction did you go? What goals did you have? What thoughts and ideas did you have? what you wanted to do? I really at that point wanted to do a more what we would call now micro kind of work what we called then um, you know casework or you know and I guess we still call it clinical so at that point I got a job at a family service agency mm -hmm. and had a couple of jobs like that where I was working with individuals and families and kids and groups on a more micro level and then what? And then once I started doing that, I realized I didn't know enough about it because I had spent that year of graduate school doing organizing. So then I went back and did a postgraduate training in um, psychoanalytic therapy at a place called the Wright Institute in Los Angeles, where you would see patients in the clinic in exchange for a lot of like four different intensive supervisions and seminars. And so I did a two-year training there. And once you did the training? Then I continued in that direction in the sense that I started a practice and, um, and also I had children. So it worked well for me to combine those two things. Um, I was able to work part-time and at that time I was the main support of my family. So it was, I could make enough money working part-time and still have part-time with my children. Um, Along the way, mm -hmm. starting back with when you were doing the community activism and then later on into the experience at the Wright Institute and the private practice, what kinds of challenges did you have and how did you manage them? I think probably my biggest challenge overall, and now I'm seeing it less as a challenge and more as a kind of strength, is that I've, al I've never felt in any situation that I've been in that I really actually fit it in. And so no matter what parts of social work I've engaged in, 
they never completely were everything that I wanted to be doing and thinking about. And usually I would feel that the other people engaged in what I was doing were much more either single-minded or less um, conflicted about also doing other things. Mm -hmm. Now I just do 50 different things and I kind of accept that about myself. But I think, so I think when I was learning, for example, about more deeply about psychotherapy, it was very, uh, you know, challenging on its own terms and interesting to me and I felt that I had a lot of natural ability which felt good. Um, at the same time I didn't feel I was doing anything about the world at large. So that kind of tension I would say has been a, a certain kind of theme in my professional life. It seems that you've done some things to resolve it and we'll go there in a minute. But you did go back to school. Yeah. Uh, what led you in the direction okay. of a doctorate? Well, I think after a few years of doing anything, I'm always kind of ready to learn something new. Um, and so after my kids were both in elementary school, I was thinking about what I was going to do. And I, I thought about going to an analytic institute, um, but I also did want to be able eventually to teach. And I wanted to be able to learn about something other than the individual psychology. So I decided that I would go back to UCLA for a doctorate in social work and learn about change that, on a larger level, change in organizations. Mm -hmm. And that was what I did my dissertation on. And I really, I felt like, you know, I understood to, to a great degree why, how and why people change and what prevents them from changing, but I wanted to understand how organizations change or can or what their obstacles are. So that was the direction I went in. What are some of the obstacles and how do organizations change? Well, I studied... And we'll get to people. <laughs> <laughs> um, my... Um, the work, the study that I did was my own research on the beginnings of the LA Children's Planning Council, which was a large, um, many, it was a kind of what we would call an, uh, I can't remember the technical term, but basically an intra, inter-organizational collaboration. So there were representatives from provider organizations, county government, um, all kinds of different constituencies. And that organization, by the way, is still in operation now. So I studied it for the first two years to see could the, their mission really was to transform child welfare services in the county, which of course they were not able to do, and certainly not in two years <laughs> that I looked at them. But what I found to be some of the obstacles at that time, and I don't, I'm not sure how much or how that has changed within that group, were things like turf issues, um, to some degree ethnicity and diversity issues, um, you know, kind of what individuals who represented groups also had their individual, uh, not conflicts, but challenges. Mm -hmm. Uh, in relation to the larger group. I think what I saw there was that a lot of very well-intentioned people who really at heart want to accomplish the same thing often are frustrated and baffled by their own, you know, other constituencies and motivations and um, you know, what they feel to be the, the things they have to protect, it, sometimes that prevents moving forward and change, just like for people, you know, individuals. It sounded like you were describing... Yeah, like w in families. Yeah. So, uh, in a nutshell, you do see the, the way people change, is get, get it, prevents people from changing is getting in their own way. In a sense. Well, so. and sometimes their attachments and the nature of their um, obligations to other people are in conflict with maybe what they feel they need to become mm -hmm. fully the person they want to be.
And you have managed to bring those ideas to your teaching as well, and you have taught for many, many years, uh, both at UCLA and USC in the schools of social welfare and social work, respectively. Um, what did you, what do you like best about teaching and the other side of that? Okay. <laughs> I think I, I did think about this a little bit because you had told me this would be one of the things we'd talk about. And I think the two things that I really like, well, maybe three things that I like best about teaching are first, just the students who I would say have been a great source of inspiration. I every year would be just so impressed, not only with the growth that you're able to see over the course of even an academic year, but just with the desire to be a person who makes the world better. And that just is inspiring to be around and renewing. Um, secondly, I think I really have learned a lot since I've been teaching. You have to, as you very, you know, know really well, Phyllis, because we used to talk about that all the time. You're constantly having to learn. You you have to educate yourself about new subjects and new data, and you know, new theories in order to be able to teach your students and keep them up to date. So, I feel like I got the best education over the time that I was teaching. I mean. I know so much more now than I knew when I started. So that's the second thing. And, and the third thing is that for me, especially as someone who had spent a lot of um, professional life in private practice, the association with colleagues and the working together on you know, projects of you know, importance to us all, and especially where it comes to education, really feeling the experience of working with other people to improve education, to make it meaningful, um, and to change the world that way because you're affecting the students who will mm -hmm. go on to work outside. So, Are you ready to talk about what you like least about teaching? Yes, I can, that's easy. Um, because I think the thing I like least about is probably the thing most people like least about it, which is grading. Um, I think that it's, I don't like it least when it's a student who's doing just wonderful work, because obviously it's a pleasure to just simply recognize that. But I think that the whole business of kind of trying to evaluate work and what kind of standards to use and how difficult that is and how unfailingly subjective it inevitably is because we're looking at it through our own eyes, I think that part I could easily discard. Do you think there's another way to do that, to appreciate, acknowledge students uh, and still comply with the necessity of somehow ranking them, or is it a necessity? You know, again, I think what's difficult about it is there are some values in it that are probably important, like, you know, being able to recognize really good work and good thinking and conscientious effort. and being able to recognize when someone either isn't making much of an effort or is really having difficulty. I, I'm not sure what the best way to do that is. It probably isn't A, B, C, D. You recently retired from your teaching. I, we have to say retired <laughs> in quotes. <laughs> Just from teaching for the moment. Yes. Uh, and what made you decide to do that? How did you reach that decision? Um, the way I reached that decision was that over the last few years, I had taken on more and more at the school. So that in addition to teaching, I was doing a lot of committee work. I was chairing the Families and Children Concentration. And, you know, one of my problems, really, is that I've never heard about a project that wasn't interesting to me. So therefore, it, it's difficult for me to say no to things. And so consequently, I said yes to a lot of things. And I was really 
working very, very hard. And in the last, I guess in the last year, year and a half that I taught, it, it had become just a joke among my family and everybody else that I knew. And I, I, I really felt like my whole life was work. At the same time, um, someone close to me had um, been diagnosed with cancer. And as I think that inevitably does, you reevaluate how are you spending your time? Is this, if you didn't have much, is this how you would want it to be? And I think I, I really felt, you know, I was not there for my family as much as I wanted to be, et cetera. So I thought uh, something has to go, and I didn't feel I could abandon my clients. So that was pretty much how I got there. Thank you. Speaking of your clients, you are a practitioner, you have a private practice, and uh, you've also taught, taught theories. Uh, among them uh, is the concept of evidence-based practice. What do you, um, well, how would you describe that? Uh, what is your assessment of evidence-based practice? Okay, I'm not sure I can answer that question just as put because I don't really have an assessment of evidence-based practice on the face of it. I think that the intention of evidence-based practice is a good one and an important one in that we want to try to understand what does really help people to change so that we can replicate it and do it. And we want to know when something we're doing really isn't having the effect that we w think it is or that we want it to have. So I think it's, it's very important to try to understand the evidence of our work. What, what is it really doing? I think that often, or maybe and maybe that's changing now, beginning to change, much of what was considered evidence was what you could readily count and quantify and look at. So you could say, well, this many people got this kind of treatment and they, these symptoms disappeared or didn't. Unfortunately, a lot of what goes on in you know, therapy and treatment, as we know, is less articulatable in that way and less countable and sometimes even maybe a little more mysterious and also has a lot to do with relationship. So these things are very hard to measure in, in numbers. I think there, there are ways to actually describe that kind of evidence too, but it's more difficult. And you know, I think that some people are trying to begin to do that. How to talk about relationship elements in terms of evaluating practice. Um, but I think that's kind of what needs to happen, that there needs to be more qualitative evidence that we also can think about. Um, I think what's important for students, though, to know is that you don't want to just be doing things because they, you, know, you think they're a good idea or they feel good to you to do. You want to have some evidence of some kind to support that this would be an intervention that might have an effect of the kind you want. So, you know, I think we need to teach students to begin to think about that. What is the evidence? But I think we need to expand our notion of what evidence is. Have you been involved in any of the um, efforts to develop that kind of uh, evidence? Or no. do you plan to be? I, I don't plan to be because, as I always, I already have like too many things on my plate. So while I think about that, I, don't, I have no plans to involve myself directly. Well, speaking of too many things on yes. your plate, and this may not be too many, but you are very involved in the community always have been, still are. You have been an assistant team leader for the West LA District of the Disaster Mental Health Services of the American Red Cross. Mm -hmm. You have also been an oral examiner for a licensure for the California Board of Behavioral Sciences. And presently, you are on the boards of directors of the Venice Family Clinic and American Civil Liberties Union Foundation of Southern California, and chair of the task force of Pathways to Independent 
Independent Transitional Living Program and on the board of the directors of the United Friends of the Children, which honored you and your husband, Barry Meyer, with the Brass Ring Award in 2005. What did I miss? Uh, I'm working on a book. Ah. <laughs> Tell us about that. Well, actually, I shouldn't say on the book. Right now, I'm still in the proposal stage. Mm -hmm. um, it would be a book about working with youth leaving care. And um, uh, last year, I taught an, a new elective on that subject. And in the course of teaching it, realized there was no book that I could use for the course. So I had to assemble chapters and articles and so on, which is not a bad way to go because lots of people are beginning to think about this area. But it occurred to me that it would be very useful to have a book that kind of incorporates what we have always been taught in our field, the biopsychosocial mm -hmm. aspects of kids in this situation so that we'd look some at early development and how that's affected by adverse early experiences, attachment relationships, but also at the policies and legislations that affect youth and at their developmental, adolescent, uh, particular challenges, etc. So that's what I'm kind of trying to begin to think about and that's well, lots of your experience has been with the, that transition of leaving care. Right. And you have been involved in both those organizations, Pathways to Independence uh, Transitional Living and the United Friends of the mm -hmm. Children. Were you, um, when did you become uh, active in the United Friends of the Children and in what capacity? Um, in about 2000, uh, Nancy Daly Reardon, who was the founder of the organization, and a couple of other um, members of the board recruited me, actually, um, particularly to, because they had just decided to become providers of a transitional living program. And so they wanted me to be involved with the design and implementation of that program, which they were just beginning to think about. So that was kind of how I became involved. Um, how did they find you? Well, I think that's a situation where having a husband who's visible in the community um, led them to find me. Um, I don't, I'm not sure they would have found me if I was just, you know, another social worker in the community, even though that person may have been equally as valuable, in fact. And how have you found working in those program in, in the programs? Well, that's been, again, a tremendous education and um, very, I think it's very important work. I think these are young, I've always been interested in the foster care system and kids in it in the sense that, you know, if you want to talk about being a disenfranchised population, you know, you can't be more disenfranchised than not have a family who cares for you. And so I think that those are people that need the support of society, and so it's always been of interest to me. What made you um, find that as an interest? How did you, I mean, there were a lot of things, a lot of disenfranchised populations. How did you get to that particular one? I'm sure it has to do with my own certain feelings from early childhood, which I don't think I'm going to really go into. <laughs> but yeah, I think. You don't just get there by accident. Okay. So, <laughs> sorry. You didn't know this was going to be a whole psychoanalytics. Session. Well, I, no, I didn't. <laughs> well, then it won't be. <laughs> we didn't tell you. Uh, you've been in the field a long time—38 years. Oh, it's horrifying. I never think about it that way. <laughs> uh, what changes have you seen in the field? Um, both positive and negative, and how do you, uh, what do you think is in the future for the profession of social work? And I'm going to throw something else in here as well. What about the School of Social, social Work right here at USC? You have a <laughs> <laughs> um, Well, the first change I guess I've seen in the field is, is the proliferation of 
social work. I mean, obviously, we are now a much bigger field than we were when I began. I think the field is more diverse now, which I think is terrific. It's both diverse in terms of the people who are social workers, but also in terms of the kinds of things that social workers do. Um, I think there, I think that for both good and ill in a certain way, there has been a real um, de-emphasis of some of the, you know, psychodynamic piece of social work. I think, you know, part of that was kind of political correctness for a while, you know, it was just, you know, Freud bashing or whatever and, and sort of a difficulty in really seeing the value in some of the later uh, psychodynamic or analytic theories and developments. Um, so I think students probably don't get taught very much of that anymore. I think it gets not a lot of attention. And I still think it's a great foundation to any kind of social work in the sense that a deep understanding of people, whether you're working on the macro or the micro level, is going to be a benefit. Um, so I think that has changed. I think now, you know, there's some increasing emphasis, which I think is good, on um, neurobiology and attachment theory. And I think that's a very useful, um, you know, addition really to understanding human relations and motivation. Um, I think that, I think social work still to me is one of the most admirable professions in so many ways. I think it's one of the only professions, maybe the only one, that looks at the person in the environment and takes that as sort of a, you know, orienting framework. You know, I've worked with a lot of psychologists and psychiatrists and people who are also trained in what's considered, you know, human services and so on. But it's really, I think the social work frame of reference and perspective holds up so much better and is so much more, accounts for so much more in the human experience. So. I think we continue to be a profession that I feel really proud to be part of. And I feel that our students here at USC continue to represent kind of a very um, high version of that. I, I really like about USC that we are more and more diverse in our student body. I think, you know, we have a very good record of that as compared with some schools. I think our own community has changed a great deal over the time since I was trained. I mean, we are now a community of so many more different kinds of peoples and cultures than we were 38 years ago. So I think the profession has changed along with that. And, you know, the world is, is much more global, as we know. And so our profession has become more international, more global, and having a more multicultural perspective. I think that's happened. I, I do think, though, not that you asked me this, but that, you know, I, I am somewhat um, surprised by how much more conventional young people are now than they were in the 60s and early 70s. I mean, I feel like my kids are much more conventional than I am. And sometimes I feel that in classes, too, that, that students um, may be, you know, maybe it's that swing back a little bit. Also, there's much more religion present in our political and social fabric than there was when I came up. And so for somebody like myself, even though, you know, I'm very identified with being Jewish, I always, you know, when I grew up and went to school, religion was not part of school or of my profession. And so it's hard for me 
in a certain not that I have a problem with people being whatever religion they are, but that incorporation of religion and into politics, that's very problematic to me. I still believe in the separation of church mm -hmm. and state. But I think that has changed a lot. I think there's much more, you know, incursion. How do you see the, um, well, the, our profession and the school, just certainly um, contributing to the profession, um, managing with that? that? Yeah. You know, I think that there's an attempt to kind of be open to what students want to explore and bring and learn about, and I think that needs to be the case. I think that, you know, I guess in a way I'm not sure about the answer to that question because I'm so much a product of my own training and experience that I probably am less open to that than someone who was trained later. Um, you know, I'm certainly aware, for example, with clients, I mean, it's not that there aren't situations where religion doesn't come up and we don't talk about it and it has different meanings to people that I, for instance, some people who, somebody I saw who was a devout Catholic kind of liked the fact that I was Jewish and had a religion. Um, even though that might not, we weren't necessarily talking about that. Um, so I, I think it does play a part in everything we do, but I think how we relate to it as professionals, I feel I'm not the best person to respond to that, I guess is what I'd say. When you did respond to the, the um, idea that the school and the profession is, adapt, is adapting, has adapted, and will continue to adapt to changes in the environment and the social and mm -hmm. cultural environment, which is a pretty positive statement. Mm -hmm. Wendy, what has been for you so far, and I think this is a hard question, uh, the most fun, the most gratifying, one of each? In, in life or in my work? In your work. <laughs> and if you'd like to say that, that's fine. Um, the most gratifying. So far. I don't think I could just pick one thing because I think that work with clients and teaching students and actually working on things with other faculty colleagues have all been extremely gratifying, extremely. And the fun part, let's see. Well, I wouldn't say working with clients is fun, um, but it's not supposed to be. It may have its fun moments. Um, what's been the most fun? I think teaching has been the most fun. You know, especially when it's some area that I particularly feel very interested in and that I have a lot to offer about. That's been really fun. Is there anything that you could say, you could identify um, as the most successful activity involvement that you've had over the years, and again, so far? I don't know the answer to that. Because so many of the things I've done involve other people. Mm -hmm. And like with evidence-based practice, I feel like it would be hard to know what I've been most successful at without hearing from them. Any regrets? I regret not being a, a doctor, medical doctor. I regret not being a lawyer. I kind of would like to be everything. You know what I mean? I would have liked to learn medicine. I would have liked to learn law. And I feel like you could do a lot of things with all those things in social work. So, and the other thing I think about regret, though, is that you can't really regret anything you've done. I mean, unless you've really hurt somebody, you could 
certainly regret that. But in terms of like professional choices and things, because they kind of make you who you are now. So you couldn't really take them away. Thank you. What suggestions would you make to someone starting out in the field today? I'd say learn everything you possibly can, even though you don't want to, like for a student, even though you don't want to do all your reading, do it anyway because after you leave school, you may or may not, you know, have that opportunity to learn in an organized way again. Um, I'd say, again, starting out in the profession, you should, you know, walk through doors that are open and try what's on the other side and not think that your first job is your last job, it's just your first job and you know that that life is a journey and there'll be a lot of twists and turns and they'll all add to what you have to bring to the next activity or the next job thank you i wish i'd known you when i started <laughs> um, you and your husband barry uh, have been very generous supporters of the usc school of social work with very specific gifts. Could you describe these? Sure. Um, the first major gift that we made was to endow a scholarship for um, a social work student um, because we know how expensive it is to go to school here and I and now he, because I've converted him, are very um, you know, committed to the profession of social work and the need for um, social workers. And the, the particular nature of the scholarship is that it would be awarded to somebody who had an interest in foster youth or former foster youth. That they would go on maybe to do that kind of work um, and it would enable them to manage their tuition more easily. Um, the other major gift we made after um, and in honor of Frances Capel after she left the school. I wanted, well, I wanted to make a book fund available and I wanted to do something that honored her contribution to the profession and to the school. So we also endowed the Frances Capel Book Fund, which every year gives out a, an amount of money to about 10 or and eventually that'll be more students to help them buy books. Oh, thank you. I have no more questions for you. Oh yes I do. <laughs> <laughs> Another question. How do you visualize your involvement in the field in the future? I visualize it, I mean I visualize it as it's kind of continuing forward. Um, so I guess that's to say uh, I'll continue to be involved at the school both as you know what I'm currently doing which is kind of mentorship to new faculty and continuing faculty if they would like um, and excuse me on the board of counselors and um, my private practice I'll continue with my work with foster and former foster youth and Venice Family Clinic, where I work with their mental health service. Um, and then, you know, 10 other things will happen and come my way. And, you know, hopefully I'll be able to, like, let things go. That'll be my challenge for the next 10 years, how to let things go so that new things have space. Wonderful. Would you like to add anything? Um, I guess I could just put in a plug for CSWA, which I think, I, which I, I'm so glad that that exists and that you and other people like you are making sure that there's a kind of public record of the important work of social work. Thank you. And thank you. <laughs>